Hey there, everyone. How are you this afternoon? At least this afternoon, my time here uh, on the East Eastern time zone in the United States. <laughs> I know we have viewers um, from all over the world in different time zones, and that is amazing. Um, I'm uh, the director of skincare research for Paula's Choice Skincare, coming up on my uh, 23rd year. Uh, not in this role. I've had different roles over the years, um, but 23 years with the company. So if you are new to these chats, um, just know that I've, I've been at this for a long time. I've been in the industry for 30 plus years. Um, I, uh, I'm not a chemist. I'm not a dermatologist, but I've, I feel like I can kind of talk uh, at their level based on the amount of information that I have taken in over the years. And a lot of that information, truthfully, uh, has come from the relationships that we have had over the years with cosmetic chemists, uh, scientists, toxicologists, and of course, dermatologists, because in one way or another, all of us are working toward the same goal, which is uh, creating products uh, or being able to recommend products that work for your skin type, your skin concerns, your skin issues. And today's show is all about skin type. How to determine your skin type, what are the skin types all about, what's the difference between a skin type and a skin concern, things like uh, is dehydrated skin a skin type? What about acne? Is acne a skin type? Uh, so let me know, uh, drop them in the, the chat box, any questions <clears throat> that you have about, uh, about this topic. Uh, or, of course, anything beauty related, you know, bring it on. I will answer as many as I can. Um, and I will never fudge my answers. If I don't know, I will tell you. Um, I'd be the first to admit that as long as I've been doing this, there's always something more to learn. And research is evolving. Science isn't static. It, it does change. Um, and But just to be sure, <laughs> I looked up. Uh, I, was, I was curious if there had been any newer studies on skin type and, and you know, uh, like um, geographic differences, uh, gender differences in skin type, ethnic differences in skin type. Um, and for the most part, no. There was one newer study that uh, I was perusing earlier today that was published in the European Journal uh, of Dermatology, I believe that was the title, and I think it came out in 2022, so definitely recent, whereas a lot of the other ones I was coming across were published anywhere from the mid-90s to the early 2000s. Um, isn't that weird? We're like in the 23rd year of the 2000s, and at least to me, the 1990s don't seem that far away, but technically, you know, they are. I mean, if you're born in 1998, you're turning 25 this year. Wow. So what, what that recent study was looking at was more, um, more of an objective measurement of skin type and it was interesting the various tools they used how they they um they definitely drew a correlation between more sebum and um, more visible pores and the pores uh, on the people who had more oily skin were larger and instead of they associated wrinkling with a loss of elasticity and that subjects whose skin uh, had high resilience, meaning it bounced back very quickly to its normal shape when stretched, uh, those people tended to have fewer wrinkles. And they looked, I think the age of the study group uh, was 50 or so people was between, I think, 20 and 58. It was like late 50s. So an interesting range. Um, they, they definitely admitted that the, the size of the study and the age range was a limitation because obviously we have skin uh, from the, t the time before we're born uh, up until the end of life. And so what about the people that are younger than 20? And what about the people that are 60 and older? You know, what, what changed there? So <clears throat> um, one of the interesting points they made, though, was that for the most part, even in the scientific literature, identifying your skin type is largely subjective. Um, and, and when 
based on what we know and don't know about our skin, there's a chance that we could uh, self-diagnose, so to speak, and get it wrong. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to touch on uh, that I, I, I don't see this in too many articles about skin types, whether it's a, a beauty blogger or in a fashion magazine or a YouTube video, but the if using products that aren't right for your skin type and or that contain, let's say they are right for your skin type from a texture perspective, you know, you have oily skin, you're using fluids and gels as opposed to creams and balms, um, but they contain irritating ingredients that, uh, unbeknownst to you, are creating a skin type you don't want and wouldn't normally have if you were using irritant-free products. So we're going to get into all that. Uh, let's go into the core skin types uh, as defined in most of the literature. Um, the two primary ones are dry uh, and oily. Uh, the most common skin type is a combination, hence combination skin, of dry and oily. Not at the same time necessarily, but because physiologically we have more oil glands and, and larger oil glands in the forehead, nose, and shin, sometimes referred to as the T-zone, it makes sense that that area is going to uh, have more issues with oiliness, with breakouts, with larger pores. And then the cheek and the jaw area in people with combination skin, it tends to be on a, on a spectrum of dryness. Um, that would be classic combination skin. Some people, though, would identify as having combination skin because they have that extra oil in the T-zone area. That's kind of like their, they might describe that as their problem area. Uh, they, they may need to use lighter weight products there, or they find that if they use something that's even a little bit too rich in that area, they get clogged pores, they start breaking out. But they would describe the skin on their cheeks and along the jawline as normal. It's meaning normal, it's kind of gotten, a, well, maybe I think this has gone away a bit, but there was a while where there was kind of that, a push, rather than to say normal skin, to say neutral skin. Uh, because the opposite of normal is abnormal, which means you have something wrong with your skin. And I, I thought, you know, okay, I, I'm all for being polite and pleasant, but I, we, need, we also need to be honest. And sometimes people do have something wrong with their skin. That doesn't mean that you have to fix it or that there's something wrong with you as a person. But I like, and so does the scientific literature, likes referring to normal as in this is the, the, the right balance, so to speak. So normal skin would be the right amount of oil, the right amount of moisture, uh, a nice, smooth, uniform uh, skin texture. Uh, and that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty much it. The truth is... If you are one of those people that have truly normal skin, it's not going to stay that way for long. You know, at some point, because of age, because of accumulated environmental damage, because of what skin is exposed to on a daily basis, pollution, blue light, uh, irritating ingredients and products, bad habits that we can develop that impact our skin, uh, that skin is eventually going to start uh, sh exhibiting some changes that will shift it away from what we think of as being normal skin. Um, but that is still considered uh, a, a skin type. Um, a lot of dermatologists consider it, again, the, that ideal. You know, when you get your skin uh, under control, when you have that, you know, uniformity of texture, uh, and you're not dealing with too much oil, or you're not dealing with um, constantly feeling like you need more moisture because if without it your skin always looks and feels dry so that's the goal uh, and then some some people and researchers uh, classify uh, sensitive skin as a skin type and I'm I'm for that Paula's Choice has products are, are uh, recently re revamped calm line of products is for sensitive or more reactive skin um, all of these skin types exist on a spectrum, which can make choosing the right products uh, trickier and it can make experimentation to find the right products for your skin type necessary. So, 
As an example of what I mean by this, this spectrum, think about somebody who would describe their skin as being slightly oily. You know, they're not using mattifying papers, they're not using the clay masks. You know, for the most part, they're just living with their oily skin because it's slightly oily, it's not enough to bother them. And then you have another person who describes their skin as being very oily. You know, products seem to slip right off, makeup doesn't stay on, they're constantly, you know, uh, feeling like they need to blot. Uh, they're breaking out uh, all over the place, and, and they know that the oil is a, is a triggering factor there. Uh, th those are, to me, those are very disparate skin types. Um, one being much more stressful and impactful on a person's daily life. Uh, but those same two people would look to something that says, for oily skin. The person with very oily skin might want, may want to move towards something that is more astringent, that's more drying, that, that I mean, I, I had a, a friend years ago who I would describe and as what he is having very oily skin. Um, oddly enough, he rarely broke out um, to just go to show that there's more than an oil component behind acne. Um, and he used to, uh, he had a bottle of 99% rubbing alcohol that he kept in his desk drawer and after lunch he would go to the bathroom and pour some out onto a cotton pad and just swab that rubbing alcohol all over his face because it was the only thing he had found to control his oil and I had to explain to him that you know what you're doing is kind of creating a rebound effect like when you overuse redness relieving eye drops and then the redness actually gets worse over time which makes you use the drops even more and it's this vicious cycle so we got him into some good products but I, I think that's the that's a good example of the length some people with very oily skin will go to to help keep that excess oil under control on the other hand, somebody may describe their skin, they fit into that dry spectrum, but they might they may find that a lightweight gel cream moisturizer provides plenty of moisture for them. That gets their skin to a smooth, comfortable state where they could say, all right, when I use this product, my slightly dry skin isn't an issue anymore. But somebody with very dry skin or even moderately dry skin who uses that same moisturizer may be left thinking, this isn't enough, you know, or my skin just seems to drink this in and then it's instantly dry again, or it's dry an hour after I put it on. That is one of the reasons, rather than trying to con confuse people, um, that I think so many skincare lines, particularly larger ones, have such a broad selection of facial moisturizers marketed for or marketed to a range of skin types. Even within the Paula's Choice line, um, as just as an, as an example, our skin recovery moisturizer, which is a richer cream, would likely make somebody with uh, very dry skin happy, but somebody with slightly dry skin may find that that's just too much moisture for them. They don't like the finish or the feel of it. Um, and they would they would gravitate more towards um, our Omega Plus Complex Moisture Cream or even the water infusing electrolyte moisturizer, uh, which is kind of like giving your skin a cool drink of water. So that can make choosing the right products for your skin type tricky. And uh, it's a good time to mention that for several of our moisturizers, as well as our uh, SPF moisturizers for day, we offer travel uh, mini sizes of the product. So you can give it a good you know, week or two to see how the, you know, because let, let's say there's, there's three or four moisturizers that say they're for normal to dry skin. You're like, okay, I fall into that range. Which one do I use? You can order some of these smaller sizes and experiment because it isn't just about how that individual product works with your skin type. It's also how that individual product slots in with the rest of the products in your routine. Are they all working together? Is there a nice synergy there where you are feeling like and, and you are seeing great results? So your skin is feeling comfortable, it's looking comfortable. The reason that you're using that product, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve, you feel is being solved. Okay. What about skin type versus skin concern? So I look at that, think of skin type as the headline. So you have oily skin, that's your headline. The subheaders that fall or the subcategories that fall beneath that 
are typically going to be issues that are more, not necessarily exclusive to those with oily skin, but much more commonly seen in people who have oily skin. Breakouts, clogged pores, um, dehydration, skin feeling like it's, it's uh, uh, dry underneath and oily on top, um, enlarged pores, uh, a bumpy texture. Those are all uh, more common in people who have oily skin, but those issues like the breakouts, the clogged pores, uh, the bumpy texture, those are skin concerns. They're not skin types, at least not how I, you know, am, am, uh, have always interpreted this and, and how Paula's Choice views it, because those concerns can impact multiple skin types. Again, they're not exclusive to one skin type. They may be more likely, as I mentioned, to happen for people with that skin type, but that, that doesn't mean they can't happen to, to, for other people who have a different skin type. So that's why I, I view the skin type and the skin concern as being separate. Somebody with dry skin, as their, that's the headline, the subhead might be, uh, the concern would be dullness, uh, could be flaky skin, uh, could be rough texture, um, could be uh, uh, more sensitive skin as well. Sensitive skin, I mentioned earlier that I, I definitely view it as a separate skin type, even though it's, it's a bit of a tricky one because sensitive skin could absolutely be a concern of yours as well, particularly if you are uh, routinely dealing with visible signs of sensitive skin like redness, uh, and in some cases flaking, uh, or your skin uh, is just seems to react to almost everything. The truth, what, what makes things a bit more frustrating is that to one degree or another, everybody's skin is sensitive. You, you know, I know I've talked with people over the years who say, oh, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm Italian, I've got thick skin, we're, we're, you know, I have lots of oil, I have hearty skin, I can put anything on it, and it's just fine. That's your anecdotal experience, okay, that, and that's, that's nice, it's interesting. Um, in terms of what the research says, which is always what we fall back on, everybody's skin is sensitive. And it, it just, it makes, it makes sense when you consider what, regardless of how thick or thin your skin is physiologically or how much sebum is being pumped out or not, Everyone is subjected to the same external aggressors that can chip away at skin's health. It's, it's very functioning. Of course, that's going to start to impact its appearance. So to one degree or another, everybody has sensitive skin. Um, the sensitive skin type is really about barrier impairment uh, and or what uh, is termed in the research vascular hyperactivity. So think of the um, vascular symptoms somebody with the skin disorder rosacea exhibits. They, they get that constellation of the um, broken capillaries. They are uh, almost always uh, dealing with, um, not at all the time, but um, varying degrees of facial flushing uh, and they're, they're, the people with rosacea will find out what their triggers are for that, whether it's alcoholic beverages, being out in the sun, you know, even with protection. There's, there's various triggers can make it worse or not for certain cases of rosacea. But that's a great example of a vascular hyperactivity where the, the network, the blood vessel network beneath the skin is, is just... It's an overdrive uh, and it's causing those symptoms. Uh, and as a result, skin looks and begins to feel more and more sensitive. Uh, that's a good segue into dry skin. Uh, dry skin is, is traditionally about a lack of lipids or fats, uh, possibly due to an impaired barrier. Uh, it could be due, the barrier could be impaired uh, because of uh, something it's been exposed to or something you've done to it hopefully unwittingly, uh, or it could just be genetically dysfunctional. So for example, in not, not dysfunctional as in it absolutely doesn't work, but for example, 
uh, your um, the bar the substances that comprise skin's barrier, the ceramides, the cholesterol, the various fatty acids. Uh, your skin may not naturally be producing either enough of those substances or maybe, you know, two out of three you're doing really well with, but then the other one, you know, it's just not, the skin isn't making enough. And then as a corollary to that, your skin could be making those substances in the regular amounts, but the surface layers, for one reason or another, aren't able to hold on to them. So they're they're being made, and then but they're then they're kind of like becoming depleted and going away as quickly as they're being made, leading you to always feel like you have dry skin and wanting to slather on more and more moisturizers. Um, people sometimes get confused about dehydrated skin versus dry skin. I, I view dry skin as definitely a, a uh, among the major skin types. Dehydrated skin is more, more falls to me under the purview of a skin concern. Um, dry skin tends to be perpetual. Um, yes, you can make your skin look and feel better with key skincare products, but as soon as you stop using those skincare products, your dry skin comes back. It's just kind of always with you. Uh, in contrast, Whereas dry skin is about a lack of lipids and or an impaired barrier or both, dehydrated skin is about a lack of water uh, and or the ability for skin's uppermost layers, the stratum corneum layers, to hold on to that water. Dehydrated skin uh, tends to be temporary. It can be brought on by um, overexposure to the environment. It can be brought on by um, going from a, if you typically live in a more humid environment and then you are traveling to a more arid or drier environment, you may feel that your skin has become dehydrated. Uh, dehydrated skin can happen due to uh, certain dietary choices, uh, as in too much salt, too much alcohol, not enough water. Uh, but again, all of those things are that upset in skin tends to be temporary, whereas dry skin is ongoing. You know, you can pretty easily remedy dehydrated skin, um, whereas dry skin needs more conscientious, conscientious effort uh, and uh, a daily commitment to doing things to help keep uh, the skin under control. All right, we have um, one question so far, and I have talked about determining, uh, oh, I haven't talked about how to determine your skin type. Um, again, this is the subjective method because even the objective methods that have been developed, they're, they're not necessarily foolproof. Um, skin type, even once you know what yours is, it can change. Uh, it can change seasonally. Um, typically not too dramatically. As an example, if you have oily skin and you find that your oily skin is more of an issue in the warmer months where you live uh, or that high temperatures, uh, the humidity, higher humidity certain months can have, that causes your skin to seemingly look and feel more oily and you may experience more breakups and then the humidity drops, the temperature decreases, you're into the cooler months and you notice that your skin is less oily. That's fairly common. Uh, what's not so common is to have that excess oil and breakouts in the warmer human months and then getting into the cooler weather and find that your skin has done you know, a 180 and it, now, it's, now it's very dry. You know, you, you, you're hard pressed to find a single oily spot on your face because it's so dry. Um, so again, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, uh, but though that would be an outlier type situation. Um, but that's, a, Seasonally, skin types can shift a bit. Um, going to different climates can cause a temporary shift in, in skin type. Age, uh, certain midlife changes that people go through. Uh, we, we know physiologically that our, uh, our oil glands become less active with advancing age. There is also, a, um, that's confounded by the fact that as we age, skin also becomes less and less able to synthesize or make its own ceramides, which are, are comprise about 50% of, of its barrier. So there's, there are those facts that can cause a skin type to change. Definitely worth keeping in mind because I think some people, um, some people 
once they determine their skin type, they, they may go away with that thinking, okay, this is my skin type. Now I know this, I'll never have to you know think about this again. I just need to use products that say they're for dry skin. May not always be the case. Your skin will change over time and, and, and inevitably you will also develop different concerns as, as we get older. Um, as a personal example, 10 years ago, um, I rarely, if ever, used an eye cream. I, I was perfectly content using my facial moisturizer, including my SPF, around my eyes. I didn't see the need for an extra step in my routine, so I just didn't use an eye cream. Um, even though I knew that there were some, some nice ones out there, um, when we first came out with ours, um, that's when I really got into the habit, our very first eye cream, that's when I really got into the habit of using one uh, and and I, the reason I did is because I, I noticed as I was getting older that the skin around my eyes was changing and it wasn't responding as well to my typical facial serum and moisturizer. I needed something more, not necessarily more specialized for that area, but just something more than what my uh, typical skincare products were, were giving me. And so I, I started incorporating the eye cream and I, I haven't looked back. So now I go back and forth between I use our C5 um, Super Boost Eye Cream during the day under my SPF, and the Original Resist Anti-Aging Eye Cream is my nighttime choice. Um, sometimes at night, I will put the C5 on again and layer the Resist on top, but yeah, if I'm feeling a little extra fancy. Um, so determining your skin type is easy enough to do at home. The steps are wash your face with a gentle cleanser, not not a soap cleanser. Pat your skin dry gently. Do not immediately use any other skincare products. You are only washing your face. Then pay you know take a look at your phone, see what time it is. Give your face about 15 to 30 minutes before you take a good look in the mirror. And what you're looking for is uh, differences that that you may see. For example. Uh, do your cheeks look and feel dry, but your forehead, you're seeing a, a visible layer of shine, even though it hasn't been that long since you've washed your face? Uh, are there parts of your face where 15 minutes after cleansing starts to feel a bit excruciating because your skin is so dry, it just demands that moisture. Even if you're using a really gentle, water-soluble cleanser, you've got to put that moisturizer on. That's a pretty good indicator that you have dry skin. Um, Sensitive skin, you will most likely start seeing uh, a redness uh, creep back or intensify. You may notice that your cheeks look a little bit blotchy or uneven. And by uneven, I mean, you know, you, again, you're, you're seeing not an uneven skin tone in terms of what people can get from, from sun damage uh, or from issues like melasma, but you're just seeing your, 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 your skin color uh, there, if you have lighter skin, you're going to see pinkness, redness, um, down to about a medium skin, you're still likely going to see some redness. If you have a darker, more melanin-rich skin, you're not going to see the redness per se, but you may notice some areas of your face feel hotter to the touch than surrounding skin, or they may be a little bit itchy. And you're not sure why, but you you know you've got that more uh, nerve-based sensitization going on. Um, so that is a, those are both good indicators um, for people with darker skin tones to decide or determine whether or not their skin uh, they they have a sensitive skin type. Um, I think it, there there does tend to be a bit of a myth out there that the more melanin you have in your skin, the less sensitive it is, and that isn't necessarily true. It absolutely is true that your skin is um, better equipped to withstand UV light exposure um, because that the type of melanin that gives dark skin tones their rich, gorgeous colors uh, is the very same type that uh, gives that skin a, a higher inherent SPF value. Um, so whereas, whereas my skin color may have an SPF of one or two, if that, somebody with very melanin-rich skin uh, likely has an SPF between four and six. So not a huge leap, uh, and, and also not a reason to forego sunscreen regardless of uh, your skin color. Everybody's skin needs sun protection. You may not, if you have darker skin, you may not need to pile on the SPF 50, 
But I would at least say look for an SPF 15. An SPF 30 is even better if, uh, if you can find one that you like. So from there, you need to determine uh, the you need to determine, once you know your skin type, you need to determine the uh, texture range uh, that you feel most comfortable using because there is a range for each skin type. So just because you have dry skin doesn't mean you automatically need to run out and look for the thickest possible cream. You know, when you open the jar, you know, you have to like, you won't even move when you're shaking the jar. It's just kind of stuck in there. Uh, and conversely, if you have oily skin, uh, you may want to look for something that has a, a more thin lotion texture. doesn't necessarily have to go all the way down to a gel or a liquid, but you need to take into account what else you're using in your skincare routine uh, and then how all those products interact with each other. Are they all in service to your skin type based on what your skin type's needs are uh, as well as the texture preference uh, that is going to make you look forward to using those products. I see a one thing, uh, Paula's Choice Skincare uh, chimed in here and said, any top PC products for someone with dry skin, but in large pores prone to clogs, I think it's excess sebum. Um, yes, I definitely, I mean, from the, 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 the two products that instantly come to mind would be um, one of our BHA exfoliants, such as the 2% BHA lotion. Uh, I think that's a texture that's more suited to dry skin than the 2% BHA liquid, although the latter, the, yeah, the latter product can be used by all skin types. Um, then I would also pair that with our 10% niacinamide booster, uh, which can have a nice, so the, the BHA is gonna help to refine skin's texture. It's gonna help to break up those clogs and restore a more normal flow of oil onto the pore. And then the niacinamide is going to get to work, not only helping to strengthen and reinforce the barrier, which tends to be weaker or impaired when your skin is naturally dry, but the niacinamide is also going to have a nice effect on the pore lining itself. So ongoing use is going to make your pores less likely to become clogged. Um, there's some other options that, that you can consider. I would um, be careful using moisturizers that are too emollient. You may want to experiment with a lighter weight moisturizer, but then you may need to pair that with a serum type product or a booster to get to the level of hydration uh, that your skin feels best at. I think, check one thing here. Um, talked about determining skin type. Uh, talked about things that can change skin type. Definitely want to make sure just to reiterate that you are not using uh, the wrong products for your skin type or products for your skin that contain problematic ingredients that can uh, irritate skin and lead to extra oil or that can further dry out and dehydrate skin. Uh, and just there's, there's fortunately several such ingredients, but some common offenders would be um, strong amounts of fragrance, uh, including essential oils, uh, such as the citrus oils, lavender oil, uh, eucalyptus oil, um, rose hip oil. I know it can get confusing, like rose hip oil. That's fine, um, especially if you have dry skin, but most of the fragrant type rose oils, despite containing some good anti-inflammatory compounds, they also contain some skin irritating compounds. And the mint oils. Those are other big ones, as well as ingredients like menthol, camphor, uh, spearmint. I don't see spearmint so much in products these days, but menthol and menthol derivatives like menthol lactate and menthoxypropanediol sometimes creep in. Denatured alcohol, uh, which is indicated on the label as SD alcohol followed by a number or alcohol denatured. That is a more drying, uh, skin cell killing type of alcohol. Um, if it is not a major ingredient in a product, as in like if it's kind of towards the middle of the ingredient list um, and you're not detecting that alcohol uh, medicinal type smell or, or it's not a product that has like a flash drying effect like pure alcohol would, 
I wouldn't worry as much about it. I mean, it's still not ideal. I would still say if you can find a product you love that doesn't have any of that in there, because we've seen the studies that indicate that even low amounts can cause problems for skin cells. However, those studies were also looking at alcohol exposure on its own uh, on uh, keratinocytes, the living skin cells, and there's very few products that are just 100% pure alcohol. So we know that higher amounts are definitely problematic, but if it's a lower amount and it's mixed in, you know, with more like skin conditioning and emollient humectant type ingredients, I wouldn't necessarily panic about it. Again, it's still, would the product be better without it? Yes, because there's other ingredients that don't pose that risk of irritation to skin that can impart many of the same benefits, uh, solvent type benefits that alcohol does. What else would be on that list? Uh, the essential oils, the fragrance, the alcohol. I think I covered all of the big ones that I see. Witch hazel, yeah, that, that can be because of its astringent and uh, protein denaturing um, uh, qualities. Um, that's what gives it its astringent properties. The other problem with witch hazel is that it's very commonly distilled using alcohol. So even if you're not seeing alcohol on the label, the witch hazel could still contain up to 15% uh, of the drying type of alcohol. Um, and it's a shame too, because witch hazel has, we, we have a, a good article on our site about this, witch hazel has its place um, for certain skin conditions um, meant for intermittent use. So um, what I would advise you is uh, against is like, for example, not using a witch hazel astringent or witch hazel heavy toner as your daily skincare routine. And then the other question that we had from Claudia, she says, hey Brian, I like to mix Paula's Choice Resist Mineral Sunscreen with a little foundation that has a mixture of mineral and chemical sunscreens. Is that okay? I mix it in my hands before applying. Um, I mean, it's not, it's definitely not the worst thing, Claudia. Um, the the concern, I doubt you're using enough of the foundation in, you did say foundation, right? Yeah, foundation in the sunscreen to uh, really alter the SPF uh, value that it has. Um, the con So the concern is um, whether or not the non-mineral UV filter uh, is going to react with the mineral filters. Um, I don't think uh, that was brought up a while ago to me by a dermatologist, uh, and I certainly respected what she had to say. I thought it was an interesting point. Um, but I think that her concern was stemming from what happens when the so-called uh, chemical or synthetic UV filters like octanoxate or avobenzone, when they interact with the mineral UV filters and the mineral UV filters are uncoated. Um, there's the, the metal properties, because you've got titanium and dioxide as one and zinc uh, oxide as the other, uh, is what causes, uh, there's a, there exists a potential for a cross reaction. However, because almost every modern supplier that I've seen that is offering these mineral UV filters, they are using a coated kind. So they're, by coating it in a, um, typically in a, in a silane type ingredient, uh, or sometimes alumina is used, or a, like a polyhydroxy stearic acid, that protects that, the other ingredients from any type of a cross reaction with the mineral filters. Um, so that would really be the only concern uh, and for certain, if this is how you like wearing your sunscreen, I would much rather that you do it that way than not wear any sunscreen at all because you can't find one who, uh, the, whose appearance on skin you really like. So, all right, well, I think we're going to wrap up a little earlier today. Um, normally, I reserve the last half of the show for questions, and we've answered the questions. All set. So I will be back with another live chat uh, later this month, and it's going to be all about uh, eye areas skin. So we're going to kind of take a, a deeper dive into the physiology of skin around the eyes, uh, and then what, because of that physiology, makes concerns like dark circles, um, crow's feet, puffiness, uh, and sensitivity around the eye 
um, much more common than on other areas of the face. So I hope you come back and check out that one and you can explore any of the other YouTube live chats that uh, I've done over the years. And, and as far as I know, I'm going to keep doing them. <laughs> so come back and see me and have a great rest of your week. Take care, everybody.